Grant us, we ask, to speak, to hear, and to learn, so that our fears may be banished, our minds may become enlightened, our faith be increased, our steps directed towards you. Um, when I was putting this together today, it's about truth, I did not expect that the week would just help me out so much. To begin with, I have a quote for you, and I'm going to have some fun with you to see if any of you can identify who and when. This is the quote. It's a direct quote. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. Who said that? Anybody have a clue? It's either, it's either Rudy Giuliani or it's, it's the new Secretary of State or whatever. One of those. Did you hear the Do what? No, she's got it. Just like this. Oh. Actually, uh, close but not. Anybody else? Do you know, when you, I tell you who said this, you're going to pull your hair out. Huh? I'll give you another hint. I'll give you another hint. All right, ready for this? Again. Huh? Are you ready? Well, are you ready for this? Hint. This is so helpful. February 5th, 2003. Colin Powell. Before the United Nations about weapons of mass destruction. They're everywhere. They're going to blow us all up. Yes, weapons of mass destruction. Did we find any? No. no. We're not going to find any in Iran either. Precisely. Next, we had the question of truth about Clinton's intern. <laughs> then we had Sharpie Gate. That has to be, without a yeah, doubt, one of the most incredible go. things I have ever seen a grown person do, let alone be the quote unquote leader of the free world, take a Sharpie to try. I, I don't, you know, it's funny on one level, yes. but the attempt yes. to defend all this on another is like, all right, and let me read me to another thing. We're talking about truth this morning. Okay, the other one is, ready? PolitiFact, in December 2018, our president made 7,645 false or misleading claims during 710 days in office for an average of 10.8 lies a day. Only that many? Now, if you're going to go back to truth, though, you really need to take a look at what is probably the best thing I've seen in terms of truth is Monty Python. There is a very famous skit. Do you know Monty Python at all? This is before your time, I think, because you're young. This group was insane. There are a bunch of English guys in one America who I saw pulled off skits. Lane. Yes, yes, pulled off skits, and one of them involved uh, Michael Palin and John Cleese. It's not a three-minute argument or that one? No, he comes right. in, and he has this this obviously dead. I mean, the they dead parrot. Dead parrot. Oh, it's he not dead. He's kind of for the feet. He walks in. He went down into the pipe. He's pushing up the faces. And he comes in and he has this thing. And Miss? John is behind the thing. Stop. <laughs> he yells his thing and he bangs it up and says, I'm a dead parrot. Yeah. And this thing is dead. He says, no, it's not. No, it's not. 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 So I went and saw this skit, and he's yes. banging the thing yes. up and down. He's through it, bangs it, and says, he's slumbering. He came up with every lie yes. under the sun. So finally, and the rock, book, and finally not Chase lets loose with, are you ready for this? This has to be the best number of adjectives I've ever heard for being dead. This is just really good. What I've never heard before, right? He's passed on. The parrot is no more. He has ceased to be. He's expired and gone to meet his maker. He's a stiff, bereft of life. He rests in peace. If you hadn't nailed him to perch, he'd be pushing up daisies. Its metabolic processes are now history. He's off the twig. I've never heard that before. He's off the twig. Have you ever heard yes, that? Yes, it means he's dead. Yeah, he's he's kicked the, the bucket. He's shuffled off its mortal coil, run down the curtain, joined the bleeding choir invisible. He's an ex-parrot. All of this about the point that, that uh, Michael Pound simply couldn't accept the fact that the thing was dead. And he's told every lie under the sun. And I'm thinking sometimes that's a way to deal with truth and lies. You need some humor. Some of you laugh so hard at because some of the stuff we've seen, you can't laugh at. 
All right, this is uh, kind of scary, by the way, about lying in human beings. This should wake everybody up very quickly because I had forgotten this. Has anybody here, because obviously I did not, taken any courses in childhood development? You have. All right. Then you're, this will probably sound and familiar to me. The book says that kids grow up. Well, no, that's not. That's no. This is this is this is really really scary. <laughs> it says Pamela Mayer, as the author of a new book called Lie Spotting: Proven Techniques to, Dete to Detect mm -hmm. Deception. Lying has evolutionary value to us as a species. Listen to this. It starts really really early. How early? Well, babies will fake a cry, pause, wait to see who's coming, and then go right on back on crying. One-year-olds learn concealment. Two-year-olds bluff. Five-year-olds outright lie. Uh, they manipulate via flattery. Nine-year-olds are masters of cover-up. By the time you enter college, you're going to lie to your mother once in five interactions. By the time, you have kids in college. <laughs> By the time we enter this work world, we are breadwinners. We enter a world that is just cluttered with spam, fake digital friends, partisan media, ingenious identity thieves, world-class pommy schemers, a deception epidemic, in short, what one author calls a post-truth society. Some observations that doesn't help in discussing truth, some truths change. I can remember um, growing up and being in, college, in high school, and I talk to my college kids about this all the time because they stress out so much. I said, I've got some sad news for you. I said, all these things that you've been told that are true and all these tests that you're taking and cause you tremendous anxiety because I have a lot of dual enrollment for high school and college. I said, all these tests you're taking and all this stress you're feeling, by the time you're 50, everything you've learned is either wrong absolutely, totally a lie, or obsolete. And everybody goes, no! And I said, oh, yes. I have examples. I said, in college, very few, very little of what you've learned will be will be even, even remotely a part of what you're like when you're 60. That's how much things change. And truth, we are absolutely convinced that this is this. And I remember in, in high school physics, the, the college teacher was saying, the high school teacher was saying, it is absolutely true that two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Nuclear fission is two things occupying the same space at the same time. I was told it is true there are three dimensions. In fact, they now say there are 11, possibly 13. And you and I were told about a big bang. Well, it may very well be there was a big bang, and there'll be another big bang, and another big bang out of that. Or, you know, it may be a big bang in this dimension, but there may be a string theory in other dimensions out there where it's not. I mean, so you've got all of these things going on. So truth may change. Number two, lying may not always be a bad thing. Now, for instance, um, uh, you do not necessarily want to tell somebody if you know that uh, I, I had a, I, well, I can say this now. I had a, a neighbor who um, it was very clear did not want to really be dealing with his diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and one day I saw him and his eyes were all yellow and he'd gone off and he found, as so often the case, there's some kind of cancers you don't know about until it's too late. They're, they're asymptomatic. And he simply, he said to me many times, what is wrong with me? But I knew from the way he talked about the way he was talking with his doctor, so he really didn't want to know. So I simply said, I simply lied and said, I'm not sure, but you really need to talk to your doctor. Mm. Because if I had told the truth, that would have not been helpful for him. Mm. Now, I've been around this too long okay. in many ways. And I've come to know that sometimes people really don't want to know the truth. And probably is a good thing at that particular point. At some point, people work things out. But to force somebody into doing something when they're not ready for it is not helpful. Does that make sense to everybody? You can't force somebody into doing something until they're ready to receive it. In many cases, not all the time. I hope I'm making sense of something. I mean, I don't like lying, but lying is not always the right. It is not always wrong. And finally, it gets complicated. I was reading a story about this. And I think you'll, it's funny, but you see how complicated telling the truth is. We all put on a blindfold, everybody here, and we go into an area 
And I asked, tell me what you find. And you find this big, big thing that sounds like it's like an oak tree. I said, what is this thing? And you put your hand on it and say, this is, Kenneth, what have you made me do? And you come over here and said, what is this tiny rope? What is this? And you go and say, what? This is like ivory? Where am I? And by the time we're all done, you're all telling me the truth. The fact of the matter is you've got all parts of an elephant. So you're all telling me the truth. But the truth sometimes is very complicated. Yes, you have the string of the tail. Yes, you have one of the legs. Yes, you have a, an ivory. That's all true. But it's not telling the whole truth because it's another truth out there. And so truth gets very, very, very complicated. Um, and truth evolves. That's the other thing, too, which brings me um, to some helps. Number one, truth often evolves. Um, we see things and what we're told, well, give me some examples. What, what do you know now that's true that you didn't know before? Anybody can think of an example of things that you know that, that are true now that you wouldn't have thought that are true before. Um, can you think of an example of, of how things evolve? Um, science has told us many things that, um, that we thought were phony. Uh, uh, people believe, for instance, that evolution wasn't true. But we now know that, that things evolve. We, what we do also know is things, yes. Well, when my son was, uh, he has autism, and when he was born 56 years ago, there was a strong belief that uh, the reason that he was the way he was because he had a refrigerator parent who did not know how to to give love to him. And there was You're a, me. a popular theory by uh, a man named Bruno Bettelheim, a psychologist. Yeah. Are you serious? I'm serious. God, what a horrible, that's a perfect example. Somebody has a theory, that they, they, a theory, by the way, this often happens too. It's a theory, the theory somehow morphs into truth, hard and fast truth. In fact, it's a theory. Then when it's all proven false, then it comes, oh, it was only a theory. Yeah, but the way you pushed your theory became very true until somebody proved otherwise. Um, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And that was the prevailing thought then. Yes. Okay, well, truths evolve. And what we learn uh, now is very, very different uh, based upon experience, but what we see. And so truths evolve. And what may have not have been acceptable before, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I remember growing up and people thought they were pure this, pure that, pure Irish, pure pure this and pure that. So we now have DNA. In the new world. And um, it's a riot. Um, uh, I posted on Facebook. Uh, my kids and my classes had to tell us where their ancestors were from. And from one class, 40 different countries and backgrounds. Oh, one from Denmark. Yeah, and 38 in another and 26 in another. And um, I remember several students had done their DNA and they were furious. They could not understand how they could get this. And I said, well, let me help you out with this. I said, if you're Spanish, yes, you're Spanish, but that doesn't mean, really mean anything. I said, most of Northern Spain, the very Northern part was unoccupied in the second and third centuries when you read Spanish history. And I did, because I knew nothing about Spain. When I got to town, I needed to know something about Spain. Turns out the Goths and the Visigoths moved into northern Spain, but they came from what we now call the eastern Germany in that part. But before that, they came from Kazakhstan, from the Far East. Oh, yes. So if you're Spanish, you may be a cousin of Borat, for all I know. Then you get two thirds of Spain were occupied by the Moors. Everybody, of course, they're occupied by the Moors. And I said to my students, yes, but do you know where the Moors come from? And I said, um, um, and I said, did you get did you get African in your DNA? Yes, I said, hello, the Moors came from the Atlas Mountains, which are big mountain chain in Northern Africa. So you've got Northern Africa, and you, by the way, if you've got that, they hopped to the mountains and went below into the, into the Sub-Sahara regions. So you may have something from the Gambia, you may have something from Chad, you may have something from this as well. Oh! And I said, uh, let me help you out, everybody. I said, you are exceptional. You are exceptionally mixed. It's the way it is. Um, I present as being Anglo-Saxon. I have 14, I was 14, my grandfather's full-blooded Mohawk. Mohawks are Iroquois. They are not Anglo-Saxon. We're very clear about that. And anybody who knows about Native Americans, they came from Asia, Northern Siberia, that whole area, Northern China. 
So when you start doing your DNA, you're going to find out you represent all kinds of areas. And um, that tells you the truth of what you thought you were um, is nice. It's a nice mythology, nice story. When you DNA, you get a whole different set of truths about what makes you who you are. And so you are, you are not only a product of nurturing and the house that you grew up in, but you're also a product of all that genetic background that filters out to you in very unique ways. So truth evolves. In short, when we're talking about truth, we need to keep an open mind. We need to keep an open mind. Although the hurricane did not go, it was not gonna go to Alabama, sorry. All right, number two, we need to affirm again and again and again there are, for each of us, true values. Each of us here has, has things that are, are bedrock for each one of us, and we need to affirm those. While science may shift, theories may shift, politicians come and go, each person here and people out there watching this will find that there is a bedrock set of values that anchors you. Um, being here at All Souls, one of the things that anchors you is a free and open mind to explore things. Um, a free and open mind to believe a journey that makes sense to you, a path that makes sense to you, without being coerced to believe anything that's not you. You have a way of seeing things, processing things, looking at things that makes sense to you and gives you substance and meaning. And we hold that, we hold that. And so each of you have bedrock values and it's really important as things change, theories change, things go up and down and stuff, that you hold on to those theories and you hold on to those truths rather, that keep them within you. Because you're going to see um, uh, things around you change, people lie through their teeth. This is an age of deception, but you know what makes you you. You know what gives you your, your, your strength and your values, your truths that make you free in your own sense. And that's what you hold on to. You need to remember that. While all around you is changing, you hold on to that. Even if people disagree with you. I think it's ironic, by the way, that I'm in two very, very interesting fields that are not known for, for being extraordinarily open. Being a professor has traditionally been very authoritative. And parts of Europe today, you know, when you walk in, the students have to stand up. I've had students from Europe in my class, and they say, you've ruined class works. We're used to back and forth, give and take. You come in with these comments. God know where you came from. We, when I go to school in France or Germany, when the professor comes, it's quiet. Mm -hmm. Professor comes in, everybody stands, they sit, and they listen. Mm -hmm. There's no interruption. There's no humor. There will be no humor. We have this class. <laughs> I mean, that's it. Um, you know, so there's that side. And, you know, ministers, you know, the there's ministers out there today who are, yes, so I'm in two professions that do not lend themselves for people of my personality and my way of really, I'm really like a layman. I have my own ways of grounding myself, my own thoughts. And so I hold on to those. Those help me live. Those help me have strength. And that's what I have to remind ourselves. That's what we have to hold on to. I see all this nonsense going on around us, but I have my values, my core values. They're true for me. And they may not be exactly true for you and you and you, but we celebrate the fact that that diversity can be good. And lastly, um, Martin Niemöller was a um, was a U-boat um, captain, submarine captain in World War One. Very, very, uh, very, very successful at sinking our boats. He got religion after World War One in Germany, and joins the Evangelical Church of the Union in Prussia, which, oddly enough, by the way, had the most liberal Protestant church in the world. Prussia. It's a long story, anyway. So he goes to this suburban church in Dala. It's a very, very hoity-toity, uh, upper-class suburban uh, Prussian church and leads the fight against Hitler. <laughs> the last person in the world, you think. He, they get him off to a concentration camp. He comes out six years later. How he survived, nobody's sure. He comes out looking like he's almost off the twig. And he says this quote, which we always get wrong, but it basically he said... Um, you know, when they came for the communists, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. He said, when they came for the trade unionists, I didn't speak I wasn't a trade unionist. When they came for the Catholics, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Catholic. And when they came for me, there was nobody left. And so I have to remind us that truth-telling 
is almost revolutionary act today. Mm -hmm. Today, in an age of deception, telling the truth is like being a radical. It's like being revolutionary. Two examples to remind us to stay with it, to hold the course. Gee, that sounds so old-fashioned, to stay the course. Um, the kids yesterday were telling everybody, climate change. They were telling everybody. Huge mobs, 11-year-old telling congressmen, Congress who can't seem to do anything, yeah. not only here, other places. And I'm saying, kids were telling the truth. Kids were, they were becoming revolution. And there's not, I'm sure if you talk to that 11 year old that was addressing her, she would no more consider herself a radical or revolutionary than the man in the moon. She was trying to speak the truth. And the other one was the whistleblower. Yeah. You don't do what happened, you don't hold money back from a country to try to get dirt on an opponent of yours. You don't do that. You just don't do that. And a whistleblower blew the whistle, and it turns out somebody must have leaked it because his boss tried to stop it from being known, then his boss's boss, and now it's a big mess. The truth of the whistleblower in our society is the one who has the guts to say, they, I didn't speak up, I didn't, but somebody has to speak up, and I will speak up. It is strange to me that in our day and age, we have to look at 11-year-olds to be revolutionaries to tell the truth, unnamed civil servants. So for us, the truth has many faces. But we need to remember, I would hope, that to keep an open mind, some truths and theories change, but we must also identify those core truths for us and hold on to them. And when we must, speak the truth. Speak the truth to power and speak the truth to ourselves. Sometimes we are really good at hiding our own truths from ourselves. I've done that. The result was disastrous. Luckily, the truth got me going again. Truth can be healing and empowering. So I leave us this morning with thoughts about truth. May it indeed set us free. Amen. Mm -hmm.